Hi guys. All right. We have slogged through the town of Atalaya, Peru, and here we are at chapter six of Peruvian Plunge, Stranded in Salvation. And uh, we're going to start with a quote from the Lonely Planets Guidebook to Peru, copyright 1987, updated March 2000. Quote, Visiting Manu on your own requires a great deal of time, self-sufficiency, and money, as well as an ability to travel in difficult conditions. So nine years after that updated uh, guidebook, we find ourselves in Salvacion, Peru on Wednesday, May 27th, 2009. <clears throat> Six months prior to finding myself stranded up the creek without a boat, never mind a paddle in Atalaya, Peru, I had read, even highlighted in cautionary bright yellow ink, the above passage, not realizing at the time they were the most on target 24 words in the 512 page guidebook. Despite my failed attempts to communicate with the Peruvian ATM network, a failure which had left me dangerously underfunded for my trip into the Peruvian heart of darkness, I figured that three out of four ain't bad. My financial setback would be counterbalanced by my great deal of available time, my proven track record of self-sufficiency, and my ability to travel in difficult conditions. Or so I thought, smugly and naively, when I awoke at dawn that grisly gray Wednesday morning in the Peruvian Amazon. The two young men I had met the day before at Dante's place had assured me my path would be fairly simple and straightforward from Atalaya. I could hitchhike on a truck to the town of Shintuya, a mere 30 miles down the road. From there, it was a quick pecky pecky motorized canoe jaunt to the remote outpost of Itawania where I could find a cheap room for the night then catch the Thursday morning eastbound cargo boat to my next destination. I should hit my target the Tony Manu Wildlife Center midday on Thursday. This, this scenario lined up vaguely, though not perfectly, with what other folks had previously told me, so my confidence and optimism were running high. This time, I wasn't going to fall for Ernesto's two-hour breakfast trap, not taking any chances. I was on Atalaya's muddy main street at 5.30 a.m., which would give me 12 hours of daylight to make the 35-mile trip to Itawania. Hell, at that rate, I could walk there if I wasn't loaded down with a bag of cannonballs. Ernesto was on me like a 200-pound mosquito before I'd made it out of my hotel room door, enticing me into his kitchen with offers of eggs and Nescafe. I waved him off and resolutely headed up the block to the most advantageous hitchhiking spot in town. The giant mosquito stuck with me, whining in my ear about some sort of alleged truck driver strike that meant no trucks would be heading to Shintoya possibly for days. Again, I waved them off and plopped myself down defiantly beside my bag of cannonballs. Desperate for company, the lonely Ernesto practically begged me to stay in his one-horse town. Finally, he abandoned his mission, slapped me on the back, 
and told me my coffee would be waiting in the kitchen when I got tired of waiting for a truck to Shintoya that would never arrive. An hour or so into my wait, an optimistic and enterprising young buck on a Honda 125cc dirt bike offered to give me a ride all the way to Itawania for a mere $70. I politely declined and resumed my sweaty vigil. Some three hours later, I was heartened by the rumble of a dump truck. I flagged it down. The driver said he was only headed as far as Salvacion, some six miles up the road. Deciding anywhere was better than here, I took him up on his offer. The truck already held one hitchhiker in its cavernous dumpster. The friendly young fellow hoisted up my bulky bag of cannonballs and I clambered in after it. My last view of Atalaya from over the edge of the dumpster was of Ernesto hacking away at a tangle of weeds with a machete. I shouted, hasta luego amigo, to him and he saluted me. Goodbye. No sooner had I begun to gain purchase on the slippery floor of the muddy metal dumpster when the brute of a truck plowed right through a rocky, bridgeless river. The driver ground to a halt on the far shore and shouted something to the driver of some sort of mud-splattered, planet-eating monstrosity with a huge front-end loader attached to it. Before the other startled hitchhiker and I realized what was happening, the huge tractor had scooped up a ton of river pedals and was heading straight towards us with the apparent intention of burying us alive under his load of rocks. Unhindered by luggage, my traveling companion scrambled to the sanctuary of the roof of the battered truck's cab. With the load of rocks bearing down on me, I flung my bag of cannonballs up to my companion and scrambled out of the way moments before the ton of rocks was emptied into the dumpster where I had just been standing. Needless to say, this hilarious scene of my near-death experience provided no end of entertainment to the truck driver, who at least rewarded us with an invitation to ride up front with him. After enduring the highway from hell that had brought me from Cusco to this remote point, I was pleasantly shocked to find that we were now on a wide, smoothly graded, and heavily graveled real road. The driver explained that we were now in the state of Madre de Dios, where he assured me this excellent road lasted all the way past Shintoya. Another road was planned to push in the, into the jungle from the other direction, from Puerto Maldonado, Puerto Maldonado straight across the federally protected Amaracari Communal Reserve. As soon as that happened and the last missing link in the chain was connected, he would be able to drive logs and gold ore and rocks and oil and bush meat all the way to either ocean, read the United States or China eliminating the need for those inefficient cargo boats that now plied the waters of the Rio Madre de Dios. In the immediate short term, this was good news for me, but in the not very long term, it spelled the demise of the Indians living in the unspoiled million-acre wilderness of Amara Carey where Texas-based Hunt Oil Company is hoping to start drilling for oil and gas just as soon as they can figure out a way to push those pesky Indians out of the way of progress. My short dump truck adventure ended a few 
minutes later when my fellow traveler and I were deposited onto the almost surreal main street of Salvacion, Peru, quite possibly the most cruelly ironic name for any town in the country. <clears throat> Bisecting the dispirited hodgepodge of frontier town fruit markets, little stores that sold identical merchandise, and hole-in-the-wall restaurants was a four-lane ribbon of smooth concrete complete with wide sidewalks and rain gutters flaking both sides. This otherworldly roadway as broad and straight and modern as any in the U.S., stretched for perhaps eight blocks. Along its route, I counted exactly two vehicles, and one of them sat tireless and derelict on concrete blocks. <clears throat> this whole area was a pineapple farm just a few years ago, explained my ersatz traveling companion from the dump truck, though it wasn't clear whether he was bragging or complaining. We parted company and I trudged on to the bottom of the hill where the roadway bottomed out abruptly into the single foulest stretch of impassable mud holes and rocks that I had encountered since leaving Texas. I could not imagine how a Humvee could make it across this moonscape, much less a bus. I asked three workmen loading concrete blocks onto the back of a truck if this were the highway to Shintuya. Si, senor, they assured me. I stepped inside a market for a warm Coke. The power was still off for the third straight day in a row, and the woman there confirmed that the moonscape in front of her store was indeed the road to Shintuya. It was now almost 11 a.m. I sat down dejectedly on my bag of cannonballs on the barren and empty minefield, hoping for a hummer. A half hour into my wait, my buddy from the dump truck, whose name was Carlos, I finally learned, appeared again to inquire exactly what it was that I was doing. As if I had not already explained my situation to him in two, ang in two languages, the young tour guide spoke amazingly good English. I repeated, I was going to <clears throat> Shintuya. But the road to Shintuya is up there, Carlos informed me, pointing to the exact spot up the hill where we had both disembarked from the dump truck. Are you sure, amigo, I asked him, barely quashing the urge to throttle him? These guys, I said, indicating the three workers, just assured me that this was the road to Shintoya. I pointed to the Martian landscape in front of us. Carlos scolded the workmen lightly, and they muttered something back, laughing among themselves. Amigo, Carlos said gently, this isn't even a road. Come with me. Shouldering my bag of cannonballs, I huffed and puffed my way back up the hill to the point we had started from. As we walked, Carlos explained the story of Salvacion's famous main street in broken English, which I will try to summarize here with more than a dash of journalistic license as it is such a glorious example of the kind of crap you can expect to find if you ever travel to the Peruvian Amazon. <clears throat> Several years ago, the Madre de Dios Highway Department came up with an ambitious plan to bring the tiny village of Salvacion into the 21st century by constructing a mile-long, four-lane concrete main street through the middle of town. Before construction began, the engineers did, of course, have to create a detour around the construction corridor, which they did by routing all the traffic, 
which admittedly wasn't much, through the narrow, muddy morass of village side streets. The traffic thus diverted away from town, the overzealous highway engineers then began ramming Broadway through downtown Salvacion. Unfortunately, instead of finishing, say, two lanes from point A to point B and adding the other two lanes and sidewalks later, they built the whole shebang. All four lanes, sidewalks, rain gutters, everything, inch by inch, block by block, until the money, like the road itself, petered out into nothing. Of course, this left the temporary detour around the business district as the only way to get from point A to point B, essentially creating a 60-foot wide concrete sidewalk for the town's few dozen pedestrians and stray dogs to use. It is stories like these that never make their way into Lonely Planet, and it's never-ending shit like this that lets boat captains charge brainless tourists $400 for a one-day boat ride. Back on track, I took refuge under a palm tree one minute from the hot sun, the next minute from the rain, to await my salvation from the hellhole of salvation. Two hours later, my bladder at bursting point and my stomach digesting my spleen for sustenance, I was overjoyed to see the very same bus that had carried me from Pilcapata to, Al to Atalaya five days earlier headed my way. I almost got my gringo ass run over trying to flag it down in my excitement. The good news was that the bus was indeed going to Shintoya. The bad news was that it was going to Shintoya at 6 a.m. the next day, meaning I got to spend the night in this pit. The really bad news was that since the bus wasn't going to get to Shintoya until 9 a.m., I was going to miss the Thursday eastbound lumber boat out of Itawania. The really suck-ass news was that since the next cargo boat wouldn't be leaving until Saturday, I got to spend two nights in this hellhole, unless I wanted to spend two nights in Itawania instead, which the driver assured me I did not. It was now close to 2 p.m., and more than eight hours of traveling, I had been in a moving vehicle for less than 30 minutes and had made it approximately six miles. I was on the verge of tears when Carlos, the friendly young tour guide, magically appeared on the scene and offered to take me to Salvacion's finest hotel. Amazingly, it really was a nice place, though at a pricey eight bucks per night, it would take a big chunk out of my funds. Screw it. I took it. Yes, the love. <clears throat> An hour later, fortified by a $1 plate of chicken and rice, I set off to explore the environs of my two-night bivouac. First stop was the Manu National Park Ranger Station, where I had heard vague rumors that stranded tourists may be able to find a boat downstream. Rumor denied. From there, I headed in the general direction of the Madre de Dios River. As squalid and depressing as the town itself was, I felt certain that paradise awaited me if I could just find my way to the Mother of God. Like the lost pilgrim I was, I explored every side street and cattle trail I could find that appeared to be leading down to the river, but all ended up in the same mosquito-infested swamp. As close as I was, I never did find my way to the Mother of God in salvation. I did, however, 
managed to find my way to a little side stream where I settled onto a large boulder near a small waterfall erupting from the riverbank. Not exactly the Amazonian paradise I was hoping for, but it would do in a pinch. And for the first couple of minutes, it was, in fact, almost pretty. A jumbled mass of polished stones and boulders rolling away toward the distant mist-shrouded hills where Marino and I had gazed upon Salvacion from our ridgetop mirador. A regular jungle of tropical vegetation crowding around the waterfall a few feet away from me. A small cloud of brightly colored butterflies fluttering around my feet. Then I looked up and noticed the string of power lines, which of course carried no power, slicing the sky above my head. Moments later, a scraggly herd of rainforest beef cattle burst from the tree line on the far bank and came clomping through the mountain stream with their trampling hooves stirring up the river bottom and their cow flops dropping straight into the water. A minute later, another front-end loader like the one that had almost killed me cranked up its planet-eating motor to fill yet another dump truck full of river rock, no doubt headed to some road construction project from hell in the rainforest. It began to dawn on me that the feces I was smelling was more human than bovine. Upon closer examination of the waterfall beside me, I noticed it was in fact an open sewer pipe dumping untreated human shit directly into the river. I s surveyed another day in the Peruvian Amazon on the borderline between two cultural reserves. In one vista, I had bulldozers power lines, open sewers, rogue cattle, denuded hillsides. The only thing missing was the sound of chainsaws. With my first Peruvian Amazon depression threatening to overtake me, I headed back to my hotel two blocks away to read a book. I stopped at the corner to make a vain attempt to call my boss at Manu Wildlife Center to tell her I would be a couple of days late to begin my volunteer job teaching English to the hotel's Indian staff. I managed to leave a garbled message with the secretary in Cusco. A half block from my hotel, I smacked into the omnipresent Carlos, he invited me to walk with him to a little lake about a mile from town. Apparently, gringo tourists from the Eco Lodge across the river would come to the lake before sunset to watch the bird show, and sometimes he could pick up a couple of bucks paddling them around the lake on balsa wood rafts. Twist my arm, Carlos! We retraced my footsteps from an hour before, veering off on the one side road that I had ignored earlier. Little more than a wide, muddy footpath, this road sliced across the impenetrable swamp that had rebuffed me earlier. In less than ten minutes, we emerged from the thick underbrush into a tree-shaded garden of Eden that may as well have been on the other side of the planet from the dreary concrete main street of Salvacion less than a mile away. Eureka! My salvation from Salvacion! We hiked down a short, steep hillside to arrive at a small colcha, or oxbow lake, a boomerang-shaped pond of shallow water that was formed years ago when the nearby Madre de Dios had meandered off to the west a few hundred yards, leaving the arm of water stranded. Carlos told me the local name for the lake was Machu Wasi. 
years of sedimentation from annual floods that almost filled the former riverbed with mud, and Machuwasi was now a shallow marshy pond ringed by thick stands of bright green grass and willow-like shrubs. <coughs> the scenery and the energy of the place seemed prehistoric and I half expected to see a brontosaurus emerge from the enchanting tropical wonderland at any moment. As mesmerizing as the mystical scenery was, the true attraction of cultures such as Machuwasi are the unbelievable myriad of birds one is able to spot there, due mostly to the fact that they have a lot less leafy trees to hide in than their jungle-dwelling friends. I am no ornithologist, <clears throat> so I can't rattle off the names <clears throat> of all the species I saw in my first 10 minutes there, among them brightly colored tanagers, stately herons, kingfishers, flycatchers, swallows, hawks, but it's safe to say I saw more birds there in 30 minutes than I had seen in three days at Dante's outpost in the thick jungle. My favorite of all was the buffoonish, awkward Huatzin, a clumsy, leaf-eating shorebird that looks like a cross between a chicken and a roadrunner and croaks like a toad with a sore throat. It was a slow Wednesday afternoon in the tour guide biz, so Carlos and I had the log raft and the lake to ourselves. We paddled and pulled our way around the pond like Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer winding up on the other side where we climbed this very cool observation tower from which we enjoyed a spectacular sunset. Paddling back in the fading twilight, I knew where I would be spending my next day. I was embarrassed that I only had a couple of bucks to tip Carlos, but what I lacked in dinero I had in rum and pineapple juice. I invited him over to my hotel terrace for a happy hour toast. I was already halfway through my double shot pina colada and his equally strong cocktail, cocktail was already mixed and waiting for him when he arrived. It was then that I learned the 21 year old macho young buck was a teetotaling bible thumper who took his pineapple juice straight. I had finished my drink and was halfway through his when he popped the question. Could I please come over to the local English teacher's house that very evening and teach her some English? By that point, I was three sheets to the wind and already punched drunk from exhaustion after my long day, but what could I say after all he had done for me that day? I had no choice but to agree. My memories are very vague of that evening that I hazily recall being in some nice woman's house reading by candlelight as there was still no power some ridiculous English conversation textbook that went something like this. No, I mean it. You really do have a beautiful body. Your stomach is so flat and your breasts are so firm. Was this a textbook or Lady Chatterley's lover I was, I was trying to explain to my two befuddled students? I vaguely recall the nice English teacher, who spoke much less English than Carlos did, falling asleep. After that, the last thing I remember is being outside on a dark corner of the concrete throughway, Carlos saying to me, No, Samuel. I am going to take you back to your hotel now. And uh, that brings us uh, to chapter seven. Coming up soon enough. Bye guys.